hi guys welcome back to my channel i'm juliana and today we are going to talk about a book that it was supposed to be talked about last year in july it was my choice for the 12 books for 12 months of 2023 challenge although i have been reading it before 2023 so i have been now i don't know exactly i think it was 22 when i started so you to have an idea but still i wasn't able to finish because well you are going to understand why so i have my portuguese editions here the first volume and the second volume uh, so i read it in portuguese because Russian literature as any type of classics I prefer to read in Portuguese because the language as as it is a bit archaic in some time, in some books even if it's in English although I understand English I'm not so fluent in English as that so I prefer to buy them in Portuguese if they are available and so that's what I did here, and I bought them in second hand a few years ago, as you can understand by now. And I finished it, well, last week. Yeah. Finally, right? And what do we have here? So the Brothers Kar Karamazov, as the title says, this is going to be surrounding three brothers that are actually four, but you will understand what I mean, with a father who is only interested in money, drinking and women. So their father is Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov and he's 50 something years old and he is well in life financially because he has married and with the dowries that came with the wives he was able to surmount money and also he has um, a conjunction of pubs that he runs in the city so he is financially stable should we say and he married many times and from one of these marriages he had Dmitri the eldest son and from another wife he, he had Ivan and Alyosha. But in the middle of the story we discovered that Fyodor Karamazov, the father, got involved with a beggar in the city and she became pregnant with him and had the child in his house and died. This son, Smerdyakov, that we, well, we never can be sure if it is really from Fyodor Karamazov, right? But Apparently, she gave it to him in some ways. So, Smerdyakov was never recognized by Fyodor Karamazov, but remained in this house as a cook. Something that characterizes Fyodor Karamazov is that he is a terrible father. He does not take responsibility for the education of his children, leaving this to the family members of each child. Dmitri, the eldest, pursued a military career and he, <laughs> he regards himself as an intellectual, so he is a bit vain. Ivan is, let's say, in fact, the intellectual of the brothers, is like a philosopher. He is the more westernized of the brothers and he is an atheist and he has a motto that says if God doesn't exist good and evil are up to men therefore everything is permitted and if God doesn't exist the man will primordially opt for the evil instead of the good. Alyosha is the youngest and he is the, my favorite of the brothers and he has um, he's kind of the protagonist in the first part of the book and he lives in the first part of the book in a monastery he wants to follow a religious life 
and he is the most docile and friendly of the three brothers. He is a conciliator, and all of his brothers like him. This is a unique case between the brothers. Alyosha is the only one that is loved by all. Smerdyakov stays in the shadows. He is a character who does not stand out. He just observes the good life that the brothers have and live until a certain point in the story. In the first part of the book, Alyosha, in my opinion, takes a proeminent position. There are many dialogues about religion and philosophy, among others, with his mentor Zosima. And in fact, the first volume in my Portuguese edition was the most interesting. So, I was really glued in the story from the get-go, when I started to figure out who was who, when I started to understand each personality. And Alyosha, in fact, was my favorite character, even till the last page of the book, Alyosha was still my favorite character, because he was him who, in the first volume, in this edition, in the first part, shall we say, so in part one and two, he had a view of life that was, although he wanted to be, to live a religious life, he had doubts, you know, so I see myself in him. And he had dialogues and conversations, I mean, that intrigued me and were interesting, make you want to continue reading and continue to see those conversations. Although he was certain till a point of what he wanted for his life, he is not stagnated in a perception or, or a perspective of life. He was open to the world and open to mentors and open to no, because he wanted to live in a monastery for all his life. But Zosima, his mentor, said that he had to spread love. His destiny was to spread the word of God and spread love to the world. So although he had some point of views that were a bit solidified, he was open to others saying something to him and he hears what others say. He's a, a bit of an influential person, but still I very, very liked him. So a misshape arises in the plot in which Dmitri demands from his father his mother's dowry to which he is entitled. But the father, Fyodor Karamazov, maintaining his attitude towards his children as he always is, says that as long as he is alive, none of them will see any money. Furthermore, between Dmitri and his father, there was another dispute, a woman, Groshenka. They were both in love with this, wom with this woman and they were jealous of each other. So none of the children exceptionalizing Alyosha liked their father very much and Dmitri with the fact that the father didn't want to give him, give, it, give him the money and was disputing the same woman was in a um, hard relationship with him. What happens is that Fyodor Karamazov is going to be murdered and the person who is going to be accused of the crime is Dmitri. Why is that? Because Dmitri, before the father gets killed, had said publicly many times that one day he was going to kill the old man. So the suspicions came on to him right away. But before we get to the Dmitri trial, we have a chronology, so to speak, of Dmitri's trip to his father's house on the, way, on the day he was murdered his visit to bars and stays with friends and acquaintances, dialogues between them 
so on and so forth. So this happens in the second volume. And as you can see, I have some post-its here. So this chunk, more than half, is the voyages that Dimitri does after the father gets killed. And I have to say that this middle was so dragged for me, so boring, so... I wasn't getting the point. Although I understand that perhaps Dostoevsky was trying to uh, chronologically uh, show to us what happened and what was going on, it, it happens here dialogues with characters that for me it's filler. I didn't understand the point, I didn't think that it added anything to the plot, so I thought these were just an exercise of Dostoevsky that for me it didn't work. So the plot only captivates me uh, again in the last arguments of the lawyers of the trial, at the trial. And after the trial, the book ends and there is an epilogue, which I thought would advance the fate of Dimitri. But no, that's not what happens. I didn't quite understand the point of the epilogue. So again, it was a point for me that I lessened my opinion, in general opinion, of this book as, and as you can understand as my reading took so so long to be done i have mixed feelings about this reading because for one hand i liked very much the first part this the first and second part of this first volume and i liked the very end of the second volume but the middle for me was so like what's the point of this that's what this was my question and so if i gave in it stars three and a half perhaps because i see the the not the message but the, the work the hard work that dostoevsky has to have done for these books but at the same time, the reading experience in itself, and I'm talking about the reading experience, it wasn't anything extraordinary. So this is kind of the plot. Now I wanted to talk about some support books that I read a te some texts, not the whole book. So there's one from Freud where he will analyze um, Dostoevsky as a general character, as a general personality. So he will talk about his epilepsy. Uh, he, he will theorize about the type of epilepsy that Dostoevsky had. Because if you didn't know, Dostoevsky suffered from epilepsy. How this translates in his works, the fact that he was epileptic, the correlation with the death, death, assassination of the father of Dostoevsky, so because the Dostoevsky father was also assassinated, Freud will make a relation, a correlation with that fact in Dostoevsky life with this work the brothers Karamazov in particular. And then he will theorize about patri parasite. Is that how you say it? I will leave the word here. <laughs> so he will get into that very uh, much. So there is a book called Genius by Harold Bloom. And in Harold Bloom's opinion, this work in particular, the brothers Karamazov, that was written at the end of the life of Dostoevsky, 
he's the strongest composed by the author. So Dostoevsky had a son, Alyosha, that died, which is a prelude to the, the, the brothers Karamazov, whose hero is Alyosha, the youngest brother. Had Dostoevsky lived, there would have been a second volume to the novel, centering almost wholly upon the fully mature Alyosha. So this is something that I learned from this book. So Dostoevsky was in the middle of writing the second volume of the Brothers Karamazov. And I would really like to read it because as Bloom is saying, it will be centered in Alyosha, my favorite character. So, so that will be fantastic. But unfortunately, unfortunately that, not, that was not what happened. So he also says that the principal women, Grushenka and Katarina Ivanovna, seem to me, to, or to Bloom, to divide male fantasy between them. And they fail to persuade as personalities. Tolstoy could create women, Dostoevsky could not, though he studied Shakespeare hoping to learn the secret. So that's something that I really agree with Harold Bloom. I think that the women in this book are all characterized, not that he says explicitly, but the way that they speak, the way that they behave, they are all hysterical, a stereotype to me, uh, a cliché. In uh, I know this is not a modern classic or a modern book, so we have to see this at the time it was written. But as Bloom is comparing, so there was an exception. Tolstoy was a contemporaneous of Dostoevsky and he could write women, and I agree with it. I only read from him two novellas and Anna Karnina and I like the characterization of women done by Tolstoy but Dostoevsky, although this is only my second book that I read from him, I really don't like his character characterization of women. I didn't know this but Dostoevsky by the end of his life he was uh, anti-Semitic or anti-Semit and Bloom also uh, says that it's important to remember that Dostoevsky was an obscurantist and a supporter of Tsarist tyranny and Russian Orthodox theocracy. He was a vehement par parodist of westernization and firmly believed that Russia were the chosen people and that Christ was the Russian Christ. Admirers of Dostoevsky should read his diary of a writer, a fascinating and obnoxious book. It is one thing to be passionate and provocative and quite another to preach hatred on non-Russian in anticipation of the end of the world. Yet, I like this phrase, Yet, all that I try to indicate is that Dostoevsky was neither a religious genius nor a genius of religion. So this is something that happens by the end of Dostoevsky's life. Because in another book called Lectures on Russian Literature by uh, Vladimir Nabokov, he will uh, explore a bit more about the life of Dostoevsky and he will say that he doesn't like Dostoevsky as a writer and although he hasn't met him, from what you read about him, because he had ancestors that knew Dostoevsky, <laughs> isn't that fascinating, uh, they also didn't like him. So Nabokov, I don't know, perhaps he's a bit suspect because he has family ties in it, but he doesn't like Dostoevsky. And he says something like this, My position in regard to Dostoevsky is a curious and difficult one. 
In all my courses, I approach literature from the only point of view that, that literature interests me, namely the point of view of enduring art and individual genius. From this point of view, Dostoevsky is not a great writer, but a rather mediocre one, with flashes of excellent humor, but alas, with wastelands of literary platitudes in between. So, Nabokov wasn't really a fan. So then he will come to do a bit of a biography about Dostoevsky, and further on he will talk about that his early inclinations were to the side of the radicals. He leaned more or less toward the westernizers. He also consorted with the secret society of young men who had adopted the socialist theories of Saint Simon and Fourier. After the upheavals of 1848 in several European countries, there was a wave of reaction in Russia. In Russia, the government was alarmed and cracked down upon all these centers. And Dostoevsky was arrested. He was found guilty of having taken part in criminal plans, having circulated the letter of Belensky to Gogol, full on insolent expressions against the Orthodox Church and the supreme power and of having attempt, together with others, to circulate anti-government writings with the aid of a private printing press. So here's come, here comes the interesting part. He awaited his trial in the fortress of St. Paul and Peter, of which the commander was the General Nabokov, an ancestor of Vladimir Nabokov, and the correspondence which passed between this general and Tsar Nicholas in regard to the, their prisoner makes rather am amusing reading. So the sentence was severe, eight years of hard labor in Siberia, but a monstrously cruel procedure was followed before the actual sentence was read to the c condemned men. They were told they were to be shot. They were taken to the place assigned for the ex execution stripped to their shirts and the first batch of prisoners were tied to the posts. Only then the actual sentence was read to them. One of the men went mad. A deep scar was left in Dostoevsky's soul by the experience of that day. He never quite got over it. In 1855, Alexander became emperor under the name of Alexander II he was far the best of 19th century Russian rulers and in the beginning of his reign he brought a pardon to many prisoners. Dostoevsky was given back his officer's commission. Four years later he was allowed to return to Pittsburgh. During the last years of exile he had resumed literary work. After his return to Pittsburgh he plunged into literary activity. He began once more publishing, but it's, it is in this time that his attitude towards the government had completely changed since the days of his youthful radicalism. Greek, Greek Catholic Church, absolute monarchy and the cult of Russian nation, nationalism, these three props on which stood the reactionary political Slavophilism were his political faith. The theories of socialism and Western liberalism became for him the embodiment of Western contamination and of satanic sin bent upon the destruction of a Slavic and Greek Catholic world. It is the same attitude that one sees in fascism and communism Universal, universal salvation. And Vladimir Nabokov goes to say that Dostoevsky's lack of taste, his monotonous dealings with persons suffering with pre Freudian complexes, the way he has of hallowing in the tragic misadventures of human dignity, 
All this is difficult to admire. I do not like his trick his characters have of sinning their way to Jesus, or as a Russian author Ivan Brunid put it more bluntly, spilling Jesus all over the place. Just a, as I have no ear for music, I have to my regret no ear for Dostoevsky's The Prophet. So, as you can see, Nabokov was not a fan. But then he goes on to do a more close-up analysis of the brothers Karamazov. So, if you're interested, go read that part of that book. It's very interesting. And there's another book that I didn't read because I want to read more books from Dostoevsky to go to this one in particular that's called Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics by Mikhail Bakhtin. So I didn't read this one because it engulfs the whole work of Dostoevsky and now I'm not sure if I'm going to read Dostoevsky soon because I'm kind of finding it that Perhaps Dostoevsky is not for me, but, you know, I want to persevere and try more. I don't know, maybe I will find one that I truly love. So, as this engulfs the whole work of Dostoevsky, I haven't read it, but there's an indication for you. But there we go, these are my indications for you to have a more contextualized view of Dostoevsky's life and in particular about the brothers Karamazov as well. As a whole, as I said to you, although I enjoyed very much the first part and I will indicate to you to read the first part, I annotated here the most famous chapter, The Great Inquisitor, that's also a fascinating read. I really like that one and you perhaps have heard it. I will link down below some videos that will talk about the Brothers Karamazov as a whole and there will be there a video about the Great Inquisitor, the chapter Great Inquisitor, uh, where the YouTuber will do a correlation with Joker from Batman. So you have um, extended view of that chapter in particular. So, you know, perhaps I'm not the best to talk about Dostoevsky because I read The Idiot, I read The Gambler and so f right now I read three books from him and I didn't enjoy the reading so much of the three so I'm kind of finding that perhaps Dostoevsky is that type of writer that is not my taste. But let's persevere and perhaps I will find something that I enjoy. Hopefully, because... But I don't know if I'm going to invest in other books by Dostoevsky. In my house I have Crime and Punishment that I bought a long time ago. So I have that to read and that will be my next Dostoevsky read. Not in the near future, I'm predicting, but let's see how it goes. I will say to you that this is worth reading, but at the same time go knowing that this is my perspective. There will be a period that perhaps will be boring and will will be dragged and we you will be questioning what's the point of this or you will enjoy it in a whole and not see a problem at all who knows so that's it for me please subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed already don't forget to press the ring bell button to all so you can receive all my notifications Leave a like, it helps out the divulgation of the video and the divulgation of the channel. Follow me on Instagram and on all socials. I will link them down below in the box description. So go there to follow me if you want. And yeah, I will see you on the next one. Bye!